Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us across the fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. Happy Labor Day. We begin today by land and by lake. Over six days in September of 1814, the British Army and Navy brought war to the lakeside town of Plattsburgh, New York. The story of the Battle of Plattsburgh involves a dashing American naval officer, the biggest ship ever to set sail on Lake Champlain, and lest we forget a felicitous fowl. Due to the coronavirus, commemorations of the battle are taking place virtually this year. We'll have details of what's happening later in our program. Let's join historian Howard Coffin as he crosses the lake to bring us the story of the Battle of Plattsburgh. The British are coming. 37 years after the American Revolution, Britain again invaded the United States of America. In 1775 at Boston, the signal was by land or by sea. At Plattsburgh, New York, the British came in 1814 by land and by sea. This monument is a monument to a great man, Thomas McDonough, and to a great battle that happened on Lake Champlain and happened on the land around Plattsburgh. Captain Thomas McDonough, a Marylander, had been assigned by the War Department to head the naval defense of Lake Champlain. In the winter of 1813 and 14, he built the main part of his fleet at Virgins. He knew the British were also building a formidable fleet north of the border on the Richelieu. McDonough for a time had his headquarters at Burlington. But in the summer of 1814, when it became known that the British would move down the west side of the lake, McDonough brought his fleet to Plattsburgh and the American army came across the lake and dug in on the south bank of the Saranac River. A British army of nearly 10,000 men crossed the international border and marched south toward Plattsburgh. It took them six days to reach Culver Hill. Waiting here were 350 American regulars, but mostly militia. And then the British ordered their battle line forward, and the 350 Americans fought briefly and bravely, but then they turned, leaving casualties behind, and headed back to get behind the Saranac River. The Americans keyed their defenses along the Saranac to three large forts. The only one that survives is Fort Brown, the southernmost fort. On the night of September 8th, Commodore McDonough came in from the fleet here to Fort Brown to check out a rumor he had heard. He went up on the ramparts of the fort and with his binoculars, he scanned the far side of the river, and to the south he saw what he feared most, a battery of British rockets. McDonough was afraid that those rockets, which were very portable, would be brought around Cumberland Bay within range of his fleet to set his fleet on fire. That night, at his request, some army men under a Lieutenant McGlasson quietly raided the Saranac, attacked the rocket battery, and destroyed it. It was one of the important events that happened during this Battle of Plattsburgh and might have saved McDonough's fleet. The British fleet waited for several days at Isle Lamont for the south wind to break. The night of September 9th, the sun set red. 
and in the morning the wind had shifted to the north and the British came south. As we cross the lake on the ferry from Grand Isle, we go right through the route of the British coming for battle. As they came along Cumberland Head, which separates the main lake from Cumberland Bay, the American sailors on the far side could see the tops of the masts of the biggest British ship, the Confiance. Mounting 36 cannons, the biggest warship ever to ply Lake Champlain. Those sailors awaiting their first battle must have been frightened. How big was the Confiance, the biggest of the British ships? Well, this is just one of its anchors displayed here in the lobby of the Plattsburgh City Hall. Wow. On the morning of September 10th, the British faked a big attack at Plattsburgh, and then swung about four miles to the west, finding a natural crossing at Friedenburg Falls, almost like a highway of smooth stone. They came through the Saranac, waiting for them were New Yorkers and Vermonters. And there were more Vermonters here in battle than New Yorkers, 2,500 Vermonters as opposed to only 1,500 New Yorkers. The Vermonters fought like Native Americans, and they were fighting well. The battle seemed to draw, although the British numbers probably would have told, and suddenly the fighting halted. A silence prevailed on the battlefield. What had happened? British commander George Prevost, having found out that the British feet had been defeated on the lake. Knew there was no sense in trying to push his army south, halted the fighting, did an about face, and headed for Canada. Much of the area where the Vermonters fought today is within the fences of the Plattsburgh Airport. At the time of the 1814 battle, this was known as Pike's Cantonment, for two years before the fight, Zebulon Pike, the famous Western explorer for whom Pike's Peak is named, had commanded troops in this area. We're some four miles from Pike's Cantonment on Cumberland Head along Plattsburgh Bay. One of the great American naval battles in all history took place right behind us. The American force consisted of 14 ships with 882 men and 86 guns. The British had 16 vessels, 937 men, 97 guns. The firing opened when the British sent one of their big ships, the Chubb, up along this coast, trying to flank the American line. But suddenly, the Chubb's captain was warned that they were coming into shallow water. He had no choice but to spin his wheel sharp left, and it brought his ship to a standstill. Suddenly, he was fair play for American gunners who blasted the ship into submission. Now McDonough takes over a gun on his flagship and aims at the big confiance. And a matter of luck here because his first shot hits the steering mechanism of the Confiance and it already is crippled. One of the first shots to hit the American flagship smashes a crate on the deck containing a pet rooster who flies up into the rigging and starts to crow and will throughout the battle. McDonough said, it brought calm and spirit to his men instantly. Another break for the Americans. Within the first half hour of the fighting, Downey is killed. The British commander is out of the fight. Also, the British were up against 
McDonough's ingenuity, he had rigged up a system of anchors on his ships that allowed them to turn quickly, bringing broadside after broadside into play. Now it became a battle of broadsides. The decks ran red with blood. Three times McDonough is hit. Once a man beside him is beheaded and knocks him unconscious. But McDonough rises again to the fight. Finally, the Confiance is badly damaged beyond repair. And she runs up a flag of surrender. From Mount Philo in Vermont all the way up to Highgate in Swanton, Vermonters are on hilltops watching the smoke rise, hearing the thunder. And then they begin to hear things quiet. The wreckage on the decks was horrendous. Dead bodies floated in the water. A complete American victory. And McDonough would take the battered British fleet and sail it down to Burlington, to Burlington Harbor to show it off. But the war of 1812 was over. It was an American victory, and at the end of the year, the Treaty of Ghent would be signed in Europe that would end the whole thing. This fierce, bloody, thunderous battle of ships here at Plattsburgh was the last naval engagement ever fought on Lake Champlain. Never again would the British come south down the Champlain Corridor. The American northern border was secure. Thank you, Howard. The 2020 Battle of Plattsburgh virtual commemoration is taking place online at 1814inc.com. Videos about the battle and past celebrations debut every day on site. There's also a list of in-person remembrances taking place. Those events require mass physical distancing and are subject to CDC guidelines. Our next story is a fence favorite. The catamount casts a long shadow in the imagination of Vermonters. Some swear they've seen this elusive feline with their own eyes, while scientific investigation tells a different tale. We tracked down the history of the catamount in Vermont to separate fact from fiction. Here's Keith Silva. If you think you've seen a catamount in Vermont, you probably haven't. If you think you've seen a cougar or a mountain lion, well... A little mystery is good in our lives. Scientists call it Felis concolor, cat of one color. This feline may be one color, but it goes by many names. Mountain lion, puma, panther, and cougar. And then there are the subspecies, like the eastern cougar, what's known in Vermont as a catamount. The easiest ways to spot a catamount nowadays is either at a University of Vermont sporting event or in a museum. The last confirmed catamount in Vermont resides at the Vermont Historical Society in Montpelier. It was killed by Alexander Crowell on Thanksgiving Day, 1881. Not only was this animal the last of its kind in Vermont, it was also one of the biggest. They're large cats. The Jed Murdoch is a wildlife biologist and a professor a in the Rubenstein School of Environment and, and Natural Resources at UVM. The largest um, catamount or cougar killed on record here in Vermont um, was 182 and a half pounds. It was, in fact, the last one on record killed in Vermont in 1881 in, I think it was Barnard, uh, Vermont. So a pretty good sized cat, I think from nose to tip of tail was about seven feet. You know, this is a large carnivore uh, and, uh, and they're very secretive and they're, they tend to be more solitary unlike coyotes or wolves or, or some of the other uh, carnivores found here in North America. In January 2018, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service changed the status of the eastern cougar, or catamount, from endangered to extinct. The statement reads in part, the best available scientific and commercial information shows no evidence of the existence of either a reproducing population or any individuals. So if you're interested in getting some 
experience with endangered species, just want to get out. As a teacher and scientist, Murdoch is often asked if there's still a chance catamounts could be roaming Vermont's wild places. I guess if you think of it from like an evidence-based point of view, it's hard to really make that argument. Yes, there are lots of sightings that come through, and the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department does a great job at investigating, I think, all of those sightings. Um, but there really isn't a lot of hard evidence. And, and given the fact that we've got lots of roads that crisscross through Vermont, we've got people out um, in the wilderness, especially during deer hunting times, uh, we've got lots of trail cams out, lots of ways of monitoring the environment remotely. Um, it would be surprising if they were here and we didn't detect them. Now, I have to say that as soon as I make the statement that the catamounts are not here, one will pop up tomorrow, you know, in the news. <laughs> There's always a chance. There's some uncertainty. This is a needle within a needle within a needle in a big haystack. Mike Kessler is an expert tracker and longtime instructor at UVM. Okay. Following him through the woods is an education. Ooh, I see it. Look at this right here. You can see there's a nice large heel pad print here. One of the best locations Kessler's found for tracking in Vermont is the Jericho Research Forest. Running through the 485 acres that encompass this property is the Millbrook watershed, which, according to Kessler, Federal biologists consider the highest value wildlife corridor in the Northeast. Kessler's tracked all kinds of animals through these woods, including large cats. Now I have to turn and slink this way. And I'm thinking because when toes are poked through, they have definition that that's, that's clear like that. That's usually an indication there's more time standing in this track. And that's a cougar track is what you're telling me. Yeah, it has no nails anywhere in there, not a dog not a bear. Now a huge dog is not going to move this stealthy. The nails are going to be out. And so it's a preponderance of evidence. It's circumstantial, but we just keep building the case until we find one that's absolutely conclusive. And so, um, so in other words, it's like, would I spend the rest of the day following this one? Sure. Yeah. I would invest my my time and energy on this one, as opposed to others that are like, oh, yeah, it could be, but not sure. But when you add all this up, it's, um, yeah, this is what they say, makes sense in the big picture and in the little picture. So we run with it. Not only has Kessler tracked a big cat here in Jericho, he has his own big cat, tail to tail. In 2015, Kessler's longtime tracking companion, a corgi named Lucy, died. Kessler figures he and Lucy took over 10,000 walks together, many of them in this area, which is why he chose to bury Lucy in the Jericho Research Forest. Seven months after Lucy's death, Kessler says he got an urge to visit her grave. The night before, she'd been dug up. I found her there cached under debris, something that had a four-foot-long reach. She was down over two and a half feet under a layer of clay. So there was plenty good tracks there with clay. There was an animal whose rear feet were six feet behind the hole. Dug her up, left her there, and um, there were just mountain lion tracks all over there. As Kessler further investigated the site, he confirmed what he suspected. It wasn't a bear or a bobcat that had dug up Lucy. It was a cat, a big one. Physics gets involved too, not just in making the tracks, which is so you have a force through a form. You need pounds per square inch and you need compaction on the soil. But in digging up a, a grave, the amount of force that had to be generated, aside from the prints that it left in the clay there, but just the force alone to dig through clay down over two feet, there has to be equal and opposite force in the rear feet anchoring it. So you could see in there how hard that cat was digging and how far that dirt was spread, including Lucy's hair a little bit when it got to it. So those rear feet were anchored for a while there. So it was very easy to see where the rear feet were. The rear feet were that far apart and they were six feet behind the hole. So that's not a, that's not a bobcat again. <laughs> it's not a bobcat. And it wasn't a bear because the bear have their claws out 
and their their anatomy is totally different than the the anatomy of a, a mountain lion. A mountain lion in Vermont, but how did it get here, and what was it doing in Jericho? Kessler has a theory. About the time he discovered Lucy's disinterred remains, a large interagency drill was taking place about five miles northeast at the Camp Ethan Allen training site. The exercise was teaching emergency responders what to do after a simulated earthquake. It makes sense that if an animal was coming through, it could very well be in there. And if it is in there and that type of activity kicks off, it's gonna get pushed out one way or the other. It's gonna go up Millbrook or down Millbrook and appears to have come down. And on its way down, it would have ended up in the corridor where I buried Lucy. And so from a practical point of view, it's, yeah, you put it all together. It's like, I guess you could call it a perfect tracking storm. After the discovery, Kessler reburied Lucy's remains in another location. When he returned home, he did something unconsciously that would reinforce what he already knew about the presence of big cats in Vermont. I had smelled so bad, I had to just throw away all my clothes and I threw the rake and the shovel up on top of the wood pile just because I didn't want to deal with them. About a month later, Kessler awoke in the middle of the night to an odd sound. It was like the weirdest owl sound I'd ever heard. And then all of a sudden, I hear the sound over there. And I was like, oh, it must be an owl because nothing else would move that quick and that silently. It had to have flown down there. Kessler has a recording of what he heard that night, what he calls a cat bark. But that wasn't all he heard. Then all of a sudden I heard a huge stick break. When I heard that stick break, I went right to it. And uh, to my utter surprise was a uh, mountain lion. And we were only 15 yards apart and there was nothing between us. And it was a while. We were there, this whole thing was about 15 minutes. And it, it, standing in that one place under some pine trees, it left really good tracks there too. That mountain lion had come to my house. I tracked it to my wood pile. It was standing on its rear legs and I didn't understand why. And then I looked on top of the wood pile and there was, those, there was the rake and the shovel. I totally forgot about that. Kessler's story and his tracking expertise gives credence to the presence of cougars in Vermont. If so, it's likely to be a subspecies, the western cougar, and not the eastern cougar or catamount. Like many humans who visit Vermont, these western cougars are probably just passing through, tourists. But what would it mean if one decided to stay? Maybe brought a friend? Could Vermont once again become cat country? The start of a population is always a pair of dispersing individuals. Right? <laughs> so, you know, there's, there's the possibility that more than one could end up here and, and a population could get started. But, you know, you've also got this issue of social caring capacity. Are people here in Vermont willing to accept, uh, you know, a large felid, a large uh, carnivore um, in the landscape? And we made it pretty clear many years ago in the, in the 1800s, really, that we did not want them around. Both wolves and catamounts were driven to extinction through bounties and, and, uh, and other means. Maybe times have changed. I would be thrilled to know that catamounts are here. Um, they're such powerful symbols of wilderness, and to me, knowing that the landscape is in enough of a natural state to be able to support cougars is something that I, I would hold great value towards. Because Vermont lacks large open areas like those out west, Murdoch tempers his enthusiasm for the possible return of big cats to the Green Mountains. Kessler, on the other hand, embraces the mystery. And heck, if you're a tracker, you're fueled by mystery. It drives you to get right down on your hands and knees and get dirty and follow things and follow them a long time and look at details that other people would think are silly. And because that's very tactile, that's tangible, that's real. But what drives you to do that is the mystery, the love of the mystery. And you never solve the whole mystery. Whether there are cougars in Vermont or not, or if they're only passing through. Perhaps it's good, there's still a little mystery about that.
In Jericho, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence. You can spend time across the fence anytime on our YouTube channel. Take a look at our In the Kitchen playlist and pick up a new recipe. Learn about the history of people and places of Vermont and catch up with our most recent programs. Visit youtube.com slash atfence. And while you're at it, don't forget to follow Face on Facebook. It's a great way to stay up to date on our programs and it's where you can see exclusive videos and content. Thank you for joining us across the fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. Stay well.